Elhamdülillah Nahmudu Nahmaduhu Celle ve Ala Ve nestağfiruhu Ve nesta'inuhu Ve nes'aluhu Al-afwa ve al-afiyata Fi dunya ve fi l-akhira Ve salatu ve selamu Ala Resulillah Rahmetillahi Lil-alemin إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله We praise Allah We ask him to grant us what is the best in this life and in the hereafter. And we ask him for forgiveness, support and guidance. And we ask him to shower his blessing and peace on the last of his prophets, Muhammad. May be peace upon him, alayhi salatu wasalam. And we bear witness that there is no deity save Allah and we bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and the messenger of Allah. Dear Muslims, you can measure the success of any group like us by the ability to defy isolation, marginalization, and elimination from the public debate in any place for any group this is historical a group becomes successful if it does not allow itself or allow others to deprive the members of this group from the full right of participating in all activities of life including their ability to decide the destiny of themselves and their society. If a group of people succeeds in doing that it becomes intact and it can function according to their system of belief. If the group could not do that, usually, eventually, it becomes completely marginalized and it even might disintegrate. We have to remember and to be sure that this style is not new. It is always there and we look at us as a group of citizens in America who believe in Islam and who are guided by the Quran and the following the model of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the same rule is applicable to us. We are successful if we defy isolation. We fail if we cannot. Are we successful? Or did we fail? I think I can comfortably say we did not fail. We are doing fine, we are doing good, but we are not doing excellent either. <coughs> In other words, there is more awareness and the more effort we need to put into our activities and institutions to be excellently successful. As I said, we have to be aware that this is a trend in human history. When we read the Quran talking about Pharaoh, what was the tactic of Pharaoh? It is the same tactic that's used now. Inna fir'awna ala fil ardi wa ja'ala ahlaha shia'an yastad'ifu ta'ifatan minhum. Pharaoh became high on land he divided its people into groups and he picked on one group for oppression. 
It is the same thing that have been repeated in different forms and this isolation can take different modalities, can be very subtle, can be very gradual, can be very harsh and can even be brutal. And in different models of history, we saw all of the above. And the way to isolate a group also varies. It can be detention camps or centers. It, it can be creating ghettos. Or it can be virtually creating a wall of fear and suspicion around this group that practically, although they live and go and walk and talk, but practically they are isolated and hence they are deprived from fully participating in the affairs that are so important to them and so are important to their children and the grandchildren and so important to the country in which they live. As I said, are Muslims in that situation in America? No, they are not, but they can be because you better believe it that there are groups powerful groups, organized groups, who wanted to do exactly that. They wanted to do the process of besieging of the Muslim community as a group. It's not necessarily by putting them in internment camps. It's not necessarily by driving them to leave. No, it doesn't need that. But by creating that wall of fear and suspicion, a sense of ugliness and, uh, and, and the repulsiveness that can surround the group. And so practically speaking, you find that all people are saying whatever they want, but you cannot. All people are active in whatever they want to be active at, but you are calculating your footsteps. Everyone is free to express, free to assemble, free to do, free to uh, pay charity, free to direct its charity, but you are not. It becomes a virtual reality. Without barbed wires and without guards, it becomes a virtual reality that the group allowed itself to be isolated. Based on that, I'd like you to bear with me into a journey back in time to the time of before Hijrah and far in place to a valley very close to Mecca. There we will see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the believers. At that time they went through a period of unbearable persecution insults, innuendos, name calling, and the physical aggression, uh, and, and physical torture, and intimidation. All the trials that we all talked about several times, to the point that the Prophet ﷺ ordered the Muslims, whoever can flee, to go to Abyssinia just for safety. Just go. At that time, the establishment of, of Kufr in Quraysh, the, the power in the society, decided to do exactly what we are talking about now. They said, <coughs> we should isolate and besiege this group. And a famous treaty that I want us to remember and to, to reflect a little bit. They had a treaty written that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well as those who believe in what he is bringing and those who are related to him, just listen to that, related to him even if they are not Muslims, Bani Hashim, the, the, the branch of the tribe to which he belonged, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, and all those who trade or deal with him and all those who shows sympathy towards him. Sound familiar a little bit? All those are to be subject to a certain embargo. They did say lock them up at that time. 
The embargo was you don't deal with them in any trading or commercial transaction. Their daughters should not be allowed to marry from Arabia. Their sons are not allowed to marry daughters of the people of Arabia. They are not allowed to attend to the gatherings of Quraysh. They are not allowed to communicate with visitors to Mecca. And they are not allowed to speak in public to preach what they believe in. And any one of those, them and their sympathizers and their relatives all together are subject to that agreement. And this agreement was written on a scroll and was signed by the chiefs of the tribes and of the establishment at that time. And when you read the history, it's very interesting how, how did they get these signatures. All what it took is a powerful manipulator who is Abu Ghal who exploited the interests, the special interest groups, the chauvinistic uh, pride of the tribes, of the tribe mentality, and the lies and rumors that he created against this particular group, and got people based on that to sign on that scroll, and it was hanged on Kaaba, so that it now became sacredly binding. And here all of a sudden the Prophet and anyone who is related to him in terms of blood relation, conviction, or just friendship, or sympathy became completely, objectively isolated. No one talks to them, no one deals with them, no, no one uh, offers them or allows them food or allows them water, or allows them to trade and deal with them. It was so bad that, of course, starvation took the upper hand of the situation. They were not impoverished because part of the treaty was don't trade with them. And so they tried to seek trading with people who are coming during the Hajj time, so they are not bound by that treaty. They are coming from outside. But Abu Jahl organized a campaign that anyone who comes to trade, he is ready to pay him double the price that they will get from this group if he trades with them. And based on that, uh, economy or business crushed to the to the to absolute poverty. And things became so bad that they say in some books of history, due to some narrations, that all what you can hear is the cries of hungry babies in that valley. And the Prophet ﷺ used to tie a rock on his stomach to quieten the hunger pains and to suckle on pebbles to get his mouth a little bit wet because the water was very scarce. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas says that while he was going to uh, urinate, he, he felt that there is something sound strange. He found a piece of leather. He got it, he cleaned it, he soaked it in water, and he fed on it for several days. They used to go on missions to find leaves or some of the desert plants that grow and they pick it up to feed on them. I mean a situation of absolute starvation and poverty. It's not, it's not relative. It is absolute starvation and poverty. How long did it last? Three long ugly years. People hungry, living bite to bite, a drop of water by a drop of water, and the sense of rejection and resentment 
that they are surrounded by. Nobody actually told them to stay in that valley, but they had to huddle together somewhere. And this is where they were. Nobody can deal with them at all. Interestingly, even people who didn't believe that this is the right thing to be done, but people in, in any establishment, they go with the wave. This is the way it is, so this is the way it is. And here there are four factors we have to ponder. Number one, the book, the Quran. What did Quran offer those people at that time? As a matter of fact, the Quran did not come down to the Prophet ﷺ saying, just wait, victory is around the corner, we will cut your enemies into pieces, or you, you will, no. Quran said, فَإِمَّا نُرِيَنَّكَ بَعْضَ الَّذِي نَعِدُهُمْ أَوْ نَتَوَفَيَنَّكَ فَإِلَيْنَا مَرْجِعُهُمْ ثُمَّ اللَّهُ شَهِيدٌ عَلَى مَا يَفْعَلُونَ Either you, Muhammad, will see some signs of, of, of what they, those enemies, will have, or you might die. Anyways, if you die, everything will be, go back to Allah, and he, wallahu shaheedun, ala ma fa'loon. Allah is watching and observing. This is the whole statement. Allah is watching, so nothing is wasted. So just persevere. Go through it, live with it. There is no, there is no other way. So this is as far as the book. As far as the messenger, والسلام, the leader of this group. He was not that the kind of leader who will sit in the shade and everybody go and scramble some leaves and bring to them. No. He was the one who is suffering most, persevering most, maintaining the smile, insisting that they do the right thing, and tightening the rock on his stomach and just with, with the people. All through. The, the third factor is the community itself, those, those people. It is recorded that they used to, to wait for people coming to Hajj and they go and they tell them what Islam is and at that period Islam gained more people to Islam during that situation of terrible oppression gained more people to Islam than it gained before. So the community was still alive, believing in what they are doing and spreading it. Then the fourth factor is the other camp, the camp of court of the enemy. And this teaches us a great lesson. There were people in this camp who were feeling so awful and so bad and so guilty about what's happening that it is reported that they get a camel and put on it uh, bags of water and just let it run to that valley so that it falls in the hands of those people in other words they are trying to do charity that will not be caught by the, 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 the eyes of the establishment because they felt that this is this, from a humanitarian point of view this is not the right thing to be done to people Interestingly enough, how did it end? Who ended this? The ones who ended it are people from Arabia, from Quraysh, Kafirs, who are unbelievers, who signed on this treaty, have an awakening of conscience and of values, and said no way that we allow a whole group of us to be completely erased and starved to death while we are eating and drinking and enjoying, this is the wrong thing to do. And as a matter of fact, the history records for us about six names initiated by one who went to another one and said, are you, are you comfortable with what's happening? He said, no. He said, so why don't we stop it? He said, I am just one. Bring me another one, and I'll object. So he brought him another one. Then the other one said, I need another one. When they became six, they called the people of Mecca. 
And they said what is happening to Bani Hashim is wrong and is shameful and we should not allow it to go. And they said something very important. They said when we signed, we didn't know that it will be that bad. And there was a clash with Abu Ghahl who tried to stop that, but they prevailed and actually they declared that this treaty is null and void. And Muslims left the, the, the valley and went out from that terrible situation. And I reflect on the main lessons that we can get from that situation. Istaghfiru rabbakum inna wa la furuhai. Allahumma aghfir lana wa rahmina wa adina wa adina wa adina. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. The lessons that we can learn that number one that this style of isolating people in different forms in different ways is as ancient as for, as pharaoh and is as repetitive as what happened to our beloved <laughs> prophet والسلام, and his followers so nothing is new number two the way they dealt with it is very illuminating to us it is determination, faith, perseverance, and the patience. Things take time. Three years in starvation. Things take time. Number, number four, the leadership should be exemplary to the people in carrying the brunt. Should not be isolated from the people. Number five, don't ever give hope. Even on people that you judge as the opposition or the ones who are against you. Because change can come from them. After all, Allah embedded conscience in human beings. Those who believe and those who don't have a conscience in them that can move at any time and turn things around. And when the Quran talked to Musa and his brother to go, uh, to Pharaoh said go to Pharaoh he is a tyrant and he admonished them this is Pharaoh that Quran condemned said speak to him nicely and softly, softly he might be reminded or he might have the fear of God that's even Pharaoh and when we see in what happened with the Prophet والسلام, have he been sitting there cursing them and, uh, and just praying to Allah to destroy them, the story would have been different. But what happened is you knock on the doors that you don't expect it to be opened. The doors that are open to you, you don't need to knock on them. Unfortunately, sometimes we do the opposite. We knock on every door that is opened. But the doors that are closed, we don't want to deal with. And that's wrong. That's not the way to get you anywhere. So this is just a, a visitation with a period of the life of the Prophet ﷺ that's so pertinent to life as it is now and to life as we may be exposed to. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us on the straight path to give us the determination and the faith that we need to enable us to be patient and perseverant and to make us never lose hope and to stay tied together to his rope and to each other. Allahumma aghfir lana wa arhamna wa aafina wa aafu anna wa alif bayna qulubina wa amnahna al-eemana wa al-ikhlas wa aghfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin aqim al-salaa.